So uh, this is a story that starts uh, 20 years ago in uh, Frankfurt, uh, where I used to live. So 20 years ago, I was actually uh, studying at the Städelschule with, um, with Thomas Beierle, who actually spoke here at DLD maybe three years ago and was really a, an important mentor for me. And 20 years ago, uh, about this month, he said this thing. He said, uh, as we move into a period in which everything becomes digital, we will begin to confuse the act of memory with the process of storage. And what's important is, is that he said that in 1992. So that's like you know three years before any of you had a Mosaic browser, and probably about five or six years before anybody had a phone, you know, in their pocket like that. Um, and that's not exactly how he said it, and that's exactly the point. Um, so to step back a bit, about 480 years, um, 500 years ago in Switzerland. Um, this, uh, uh, this is an uh, etching by Hans Holbein called uh, Schlechtenkrieg, Bad War, depicting uh, Swiss mercenaries. And um, Swiss mercenaries, it was kind of a bad job. Um, the, uh, the number one cause of death was getting cut up by the people that you were fighting. But the interesting thing was the number two cause of death, uh, which was related to memory. Um, and it was given a name that was very specific to these mercenaries. And that name was uh, the Schweizer Heimweh. And the Schweizer Heimweh, the Swiss homesickness, we'd have to say, was so dangerous that it led to sort of epidemic suicide uh, within the mercenaries. Um, uh, it, was, it was so toxic uh, to the army that it was forbidden uh, as a Swiss soldier, as a Swiss mercenary, to sing Swiss songs, um, uh, to sort of engage in Swiss culture while they were abroad, because their sense of displacement from anything that they knew and anything that they cared about, thank you, was so acute that anything that overemphasized that could actually lead to their death. And it's important to remember this, right, that the, the stakes of memory can actually be kind of that high. Um, 200 years later, the Schweizer Heimweh uh, was renamed uh, by Johannes Hofer, a Swiss doctor. Um, he took the Schweizer Heimweh and renamed it as it was sort of more pervasive in culture uh, to another pathology, a, a specific disease that he called nostalgia. Um, the sad mood originating from the desire for return to one's native land. And this was a clinical diagnosis. You'd be hospitalized for nostalgia. And uh, like most pathologies, this has simply kind of become culture. Uh, it's become sort of part of our everyday life. And you know, if you just look at where we are, Right, and who's here. There's very few of us who actually live here. We shift our context all the time, constantly. And even if we don't move, the world moves around us at this kind of incredible rate. And if you, you think about, you know, if you shift it with, you know, sort of jet fuel or drugs or whatever you use, overall, nostalgia has kind of been delisted from pathology. Um, it's just fully integrated into our everyday life. It's like a kind of vapor that fills the room. And so we developed these kind of weird compensatory strategies. Um, they're primarily around documentation and storage to get back to some of the things that Thomas Byerly was talking about 20 years ago. Um, compensatory strategies like sort of documenting every single thing. This is a artwork by um, uh, the Dutch artist Eric Kessels. This is, uh, he printed out 24 hours of all the photos from Flickr. So that's one day. Uh, that's over a million photos that fills the room there. And this is, of course, the premise. I mean, we do this, all of us. We do this pathologically in the genuine sense of pathology. And of course, that's the, it's the premise of Facebook, the idea that we will accumulate these things so that they are not forgotten, so that they can be sort of pushed out. And more and more of our lives are kind of actively logged. These are, uh, these are friends of mine who are hooked up with Fitbits, right, that record their steps, right? So this is the ongoing competition that we all have about who can walk the most or the fastest or the furthest. Um, and the thing is, is, is that, of course, a lot of the memories or a lot of the storage that's being produced isn't active. It's passive. Um, this is a book done by a friend of mine, James Bridal, called Where the Fuck Was I, which was, took the location data that the iPhone captures passively, automatically, it should also be said secretly, uh, uh, and actually sort of pulled that out and had that automatically generate a book of every single place that he'd been uh, for a year. These are the kinds of compensatory strategies that we are seeing, you know, sort of from the small to the large, to kind of deal with the deluge. Um, and, you know, there are these applications and startups and so on. This is one called Evernote, 
uh, and they say, these simple steps will get you, will put you on the path to a superhuman memory. On the path to a superhuman memory. So about that superhuman memory, this is Jill Price. Um, she's one of about, she's one of, depending on who you talk to, four or six people on the planet who has perfect episodic memory, who can't actually forget anything that has ever happened in her life. Um, every meal, every episode of every TV show, every angry word that's ever been spoken. And she's, you know, she's like a neurological edge case. You know, she's absolutely the extreme of the extreme. And there's all these scientists who scan her brain to try to figure out what's going on in there. Um, but I think also, besides being a neurological edge case, she's kind of like a harbinger of a world to come. You know, that this is sort of, in a way, what all of us know it or not, are aspiring to. And it is, of course, uh, you know, a nightmare. Um, uh, it's a total nightmare. And the way that, uh, uh, the way that uh, it was described in an article in the Spiegel, she said, uh, in addition to good memories, every angry word, every mistake, every disappointment, every shock, and every moment of pain goes unforgotten. Time heals no wounds for Price. I don't look back at the past with any distance. It's more like experiencing everything over and over again. And those memories trigger exactly the same emotions in me. It's like an endless chaotic film that can completely overpower me. And there's no stop button. Which doesn't sound that good. And yet, this is what we're building. Right? This is Facebook timeline. Um, and here, the, uh, this is the, the video that they made to explain it. Um, and it is effectively to produce Jill Price's condition for each and every one of us, in which the stop button is kind of replaced by the like button. Um, and all of it made possible by the common ability and our personal desire to just record every single thing that happens. And it's led to this kind of fallacy in part about the future, right? Because one of the reasons that all of this is happening, or you know, there's, a, there's a whole sort of ethos around being able to predict uh, what is going to happen based on everything that's happened. Um, it was recently addressed by Duncan Watts in his book, Everything is Obvious Once You Know the Answer. Uh, and, um, and he was talking about sort of the, the fashion and the ethos of predictive analytics. And he said, our impressive ability, this is to talk about the future, our impressive ability to make sense of behavior does not imply a corresponding ability to, pr to predict it. When we think about the future, we imagine it to be a unique thread of events that simply hasn't been revealed to us yet. In reality, no such thread exists. And the thing is, is, is that that's true about the future. And it doesn't matter how much data you've got. There is no single thread that's going to be revealed. And the thing is, is that the past isn't a single thread either. But we're treating it the same way. And the, the kind of the ideology of predictive analytics is the same ideology of Facebook timeline. And it reflects an overall approach of kind of outsourcing memory to the machine. Um, and the point is, is, is that here we are 20 years later, and Thomas was kind of right. Um, we've confused human memory with digital storage. And all of the fragile qualities of memories that are kind of necessary to thrive and to survive, those are kind of ebbing away. And, and but, and also, and meanwhile, there's all this stuff that's kind of coming in at the edges, right? If you put Facebook timeline at the center as the kind of like trophy of nothing ever going forgotten, there are all these kind of things that are sort of clustering around it. There's like a dozen startups that all promise to do this thing better than any of the others, to record more of your past better or more automatically or more simply. But there's one or two of them that take a really unique approach, and that's what I'm really interested in. Um, one is called Photo Jojo, and the other one is called Timehop. And I should caveat that Timehop is a company that I love uh, so much that I invested a little bit in them and advised them how I can. And this is what they do. This is what Timehop does, is it sends email um, every day. Um, every day, it sends me an email from one year ago, um, from exactly one year ago. Uh, so every morning at 8 AM, I get an email. This is an example. Um, and it's the only email that I read in the morning. Um, and it's an index of my Facebook posts and Foursquare check-ins and Instagram photos and tweets. And this is uh, from a few days ago. And it reminded me of a brunch that I had with a few friends who were visiting from London. And then two of us got on a train and went up to New Haven. Um, and it's the, it's the quality of it being that small and that precise and that meaningful that it was that day one year ago that that produces this kind of weird, irrational joy. 
every morning. I can't, it doesn't sort of match up to anything else that my computer does, especially in the morning, which is always awful. Um, and the reason that it's sort of worth pointing out is what is so distinct about this approach, what's so important about just this, just this difference between saying, here's the place where you go to find your entire life, and saying, every day at 8 a.m., remember that thing a year ago, is, is that that approach is sort of, it's the opposite of the everything. And it's kind of like a homeopathic approach to memory. It's to provide just enough, just the smallest possible amount, to produce and reproduce that story in my mind. And that it's a kind of a prompt, it pushes out. And it's this sort of chance to kind of actually remember and recall and imagine. And I have to kind of like fill it in, right? It's just the tiny little pieces of data. And that filling in is the sensuous act. And this is a sort of new type of software. Um, and I think we're just seeing the beginning of it. Um, software that produces memories instead of preserving them. And I think, just as importantly, it's also it's a new use for what we would call social software, for social media. Um, the whole point of it is, is that we're supposed to be logging and declaring and checking in for our friends to let them know what we're doing and where we are and what we're thinking. And that this is a reminder that you know, your first friend is you, um, and that who you speak to is your own past and your own future. And software that's built for that kind of communication, like a full communication between you and yourself, that's memory, and that's the future of memory. Thanks. I'd like to tell you about this new project I've been working on for the last few years, actually. Uh, but I'm going to do it in a kind of roundabout way. And it, it actually has a lot to do with some of the things Kevin was talking about around, like, what's the right way to design software that actually is good for the spirit and good for the soul and actually nourishes you in some way. Um, so I'd like to tell you just a little bit of my own story and some turning points in my life over the last 10 years or so that have somehow informed this project. So um, I, I used to live in Brooklyn, uh, New York for about six years. And when I was uh, younger, in my early 20s, I, I got very lucky. And I had a, kind of a, some success at a pretty young age. I had some projects that got a lot of attention. I was started getting invited to all of these fancy conferences like DLD and fancy parties and things. And gradually, I started to feel like more and more out of touch with like who I was as a, as a person. And um, this, uh, this started to grow in me, this feeling. And it came to a tea one night. Um, I was having a dinner party for about 12 people in my apartment. This was a picture of my apartment then. And we had about 18 bottles of wine, and it went until uh, 5 o'clock in the morning. And my friend Henry was sleeping on the couch, that couch right there, that night. And the next morning, we were awoken very suddenly at about 8 o'clock on a Sunday morning by this boom noise and this vibration. And um, a car had actually driven into my building um, and smashed a hole in the brick and gone in. And it just felt like one of these kind of omens that it was time to, to make a change. Um, and so, <laughs> so I, I left. I decided to leave. I cleaned out my place. I gave up my place. I got a U-Haul truck. I packed up all my stuff. I brought it up to my mom's house in Vermont. And I spent the next week cleaning out my childhood bedroom. I I threw out about 18 garbage bags of stuff. Um, and then I started driving west out to Oregon, where I was going to live in the woods for a while. Um, this is a, a picture I took in the Badlands of South Dakota on the way when these grasshoppers were jumping up out of the grass onto the windshield of my car. And it just felt like this very strange signal from some kind of alien culture that things were about to get really crazy. Um, and uh, I, I ended up living in this little cabin in the woods for about four and a half months. Um, uh, I would see another person about once every four days when I went to buy groceries. And, um, and I started thinking a lot about this quote. This is actually the quote I ended my DLD talk with two years ago. It's a quote by Carl Jung, which goes, uh, one without a myth is like one uprooted, having no true link either with the past or with the ancestral life which continues within him, or yet with contemporary human society. To know your myth is the task of all tasks. And you know, I, I started to become really interested in this idea that in some sense, like no matter what you do in your life, if you make a lot of money or make art or have a family or travel widely, like in some sense, what you're really doing with your life is you're creating your life story, which is kind of this container that holds all of that other stuff. And um, when you start to see your life that way, I think it has a big effect on the way you live it and the types of choices you end up making. And it, it's a change from this kind of react reactionary culture that we live in right now, where we're constantly responding to tweets and text messages and blurbs all the time. And like we're in this constant reactionary state. And so it's a little bit about stepping back and trying to see the big picture of things. 
Um, so I, I got very interested in this, and I had actually been, been interested in this stuff for many years. When I was younger, when I was a teenager, I, I did lots of oil paintings and more traditional visual art. I used to keep these very elaborate sketchbooks that I would try to add a page to every day that were filled with dead insects and plants and ticket stubs and watercolor paintings and writings. And uh, they were these, this like living record of my life that would grow a little bit and become a little bit richer every single day. And I loved this feeling of slowly building something over time. Uh, it's a feeling I've never really had on the internet since I turned to digital things. Uh, some of them were very personal, some of them involved photographs, um, some of them, again, had these plants and things. Uh, this is a portrait I did using a stone that I found in a riverbed in, um, in Burma. Uh, and um, I, I, anyway, I kept these books for about four and a half years, and uh, I stopped keeping them very abruptly in 2003. I was traveling in Central America, and I was walking down the street in San Jose, Costa Rica, and it was broad daylight, and I suddenly felt people bearing down on me and someone had grabbed my arms and put a gun on my head and pushed it down. And another guy took a knife and started cutting the strap of my bag uh, and handed the bag to another guy who ran away with it. And inside that bag, which was stolen, was a sketchbook with about eight and a half months of work. Um, and uh, at that point, uh, I, I didn't know it at the time, it was very traumatic and I, I also got beaten up pretty bad, but it ended up being this doorway into a new chapter of life for me. Uh, and at that point, I, I stopped painting, I stopped drawing, and I turned completely to the internet. Um, I was 22 at the time. And I spent most of my early 20s doing these web projects. This was one called 10 by 10, early one that makes a grid of photos every hour. Uh, this was a We Feel Fine, which was a search engine for feelings. Um, this was called Universe, which was trying to come up with a new mythology for the world based on global news coverage. Uh, this was called I Want You to Want Me. It was a piece done for MoMA in New York about online dating. Um, and this one was The Whale Hunt, which was a weird documentary project of an Alaskan Eskimo whale hunt. Um, Anyway, I, I had done all these projects that were basically portraits about other people or portraits about the larger world, and I started to feel the limitations of that. Um, there were certain types of insights that felt uh, off limits to me when I was always studying others. And so I, I wanted to turn inwards a little bit um, and study my own experience a little bit more. And so I started this project um, on my 30th birthday where I started taking a photograph and writing a, sh a story every day and putting them on my website before I went to sleep. Uh, and I did this uh, for 440 days, starting here in this cabin, and then I went down to Santa Fe for a while. I was living in a town in northern Iceland in a fjord, um, living in this little grass uh, hut, which all the German tourists thought was a museum, so they were always looking into my window. <laughs> it's very strange. Um, then I went up to northern Vermont and then back to this town in Iceland to live in this old church uh, during the winter with the amazing Aurora. Um, and I finally found myself in Stockholm one day. I was, it was a Sunday morning and I was looking for a cafe to do some writing in. Um, but the cafe was playing really bad Bee Gees music, so I decided to go looking for another place. And there was this library across the street, and I, I, I love libraries, so I decided I would go into it. And I went up, I walked up the stairs, and I noticed that there were these little hieroglyphics, like these little sculptures, all around the edge of the library. And as I looked closer, I saw that they were actually memorializing all of the major human inventions from the wheel up until the computer in this very simple iconography. And I, it started me thinking in this kind of way. And, I, and then I walked into the building and had this weird marble foyer, all in black marble. And then I walked up the stairs and I came into this main atrium. And my heart just kind of soared when I went into this room. And, um, and I had this feeling that it would be a very beautiful thing to try to build a library like this for human experiences. Um, you know, we have libraries for every other kind of thing, literature and history and uh, math and science, but we actually don't have a library for the stuff that ordinary people go through in their everyday lives, you know. Uh, a section about first dates, uh, and a section about um, women who just have been diagnosed with breast cancer and how they're dealing with that, and a section about kids whose parents are getting older and approaching death and how they're dealing with that. And, um, almost like a guidebook for living, but not in a kind of self-help way, but just like the honest testimonies of, you know, here's who I am, this is the thing that happened to me, this is how I dealt with it, and maybe this will be useful to you. Um, and so I, I started trying to, trying to build this thing, and I, I ended up in Northern California, where I live at the moment, living in this beach community, and I was putting the finishing touches on this cowbird project. Um, 
At the same time, I started getting really interested in the Occupy Wall Street movement. I spent a lot of time at Occupy Oakland, got to know a lot of the people there. Um, this is one of the organizers, they're called Leo. Um, this was a girl named Natalia who was making flags for one of the camps. An older man named Lyndon who was a revolutionary from the 60s. Uh, a homeless guy who was get there to get a free sleeping bag. And I, I was really interested in this, not so much from an ideological standpoint, but just as a human phenomenon. Like, never in my life up until this age have I seen so so many humans coalescing around one idea at one moment in time, and it felt very interesting for that reason. Uh, at the same time, it was clear that the, the mainstream media was really struggling with how to cover this type of a news event, which is global and networked and changing very quickly. Um, and so I started spending a lot more time. This was, uh, this was November 2nd on the general strike when people marched through the streets of Oakland uh, and then marched into the port and shut down the port. Uh, there was this general feeling of euphoria in the air. No police were, were present. It was very strange and surreal. People were climbing on the structures, sitting on the train tracks, making out. Um, and then people returned to the downtown next to the camp uh, under the cover of darkness, and someone had strung up this big death to capitalism banner, very Oakland. Um, but there was still this kind of euphoria in the air. And uh, then I noticed this group of kids wearing all black and with masks on that were going into a little alleyway, and I thought I would follow them, and they ended up breaking into this building um, and going inside. These were the black block anarchist kids, and I was actually the first one in here with a camera, and I was taking pictures of this thing happening, and until one of the guys came up to me and he said, hey man, like through his mask, he's like, hey man, you better put away that fucking camera if you know what's good for you. And it was just really charged and intense, um, and they were drawing on the walls of Sharpies and making these crazy graffiti. Um, and there was this feeling that things were about to get really, really, really crazy. And um, sure enough, about 300 cops in full riot gear showed up, um, looking kind of like video game villains. And uh, the anarchists built these barricades in the street, and they lit them on fire. It was just wild. People were screaming. Um, they were waving flags, standing on the barricades. And the police, at this point, were giving dispersal warnings, saying that they were about to fire chemical agents into the crowd. And we had about 45 seconds to disperse. And um, there was this feeling of hysteria. People were wrapping up their heads in scarves filled with vinegar to block against the tear gas that was coming. Other people had gas masks and were putting them on. Um, and there was this general feeling of panic. And I was in the middle of this, and the cops made another announcement. They said, 30, 30 more seconds, and we're going to chemical agents will be used against you. And um, there was this feeling of panic. And I looked over, and I saw this happening. Um, this was a couple just like kissing in the middle of this hall. And I saw this, and I took a picture of this. And I thought to myself, in a way, you know, like, in a way, like, that's what it's all about somehow, you know? It's like we're, you're living in this crazy chaos, and the stuff is swirling all around us, and we can feel so out of control, yet it's the way that we manage to preserve who we are as people in the middle of that. It's the way that we preserve, really, just our humanity in the middle of all that, um, and that somehow that's really what it's about. Um, and uh, so it was this quick kind of insight, and then the tear gas came, and it was incredibly painful, um, and I actually ended up getting arrested that night and spent the night in the Oakland jail um, until like 3 p.m. the next day. Uh, this was a local photojournalist took this and emailed it to me. Um, and I, I started to realize that there were these things happening in the world now, things like the Occupy Wall Street movement, the, the war in Iraq, the Arab Spring, the Japanese earthquake, the Indian tsunami, these things that are so big and touching so many people's lives and changing so quickly that they're very hard to write about and talk about and summarize while they're happening. Um, and they're really like these sagas of our, of our modern times, and they, they touch us all. Um, and it's very easy to feel out of control, to feel like these sagas are dominating your life. But, but actually, these sagas are really just made up of stories. And they're made up of the stories of the people whose lives are touched by these things, which end up defining what these things are. And um, so I got really interested in this idea of uh, this kind of new approach to journalism, where you take these major news events and you humanize them through just the simple human stories of the people involved. And that's what led into this Cowbird project, which um, I'd like to show you uh, quickly now. Um, so Cowbird is this uh, kind of storytelling system that I've been developing for the last, oh, oh, there you go, thanks. Um, this is, uh, this is uh, well, let me show you first the Occupy saga. So we started Cowbird with Occupy stories, and this is stories all about the Occupy Wall Street movement coming from hundreds of people all over the world who have experienced this in their own individual ways. And, uh, and some of these are, are big stories, some of them are very small stories. To give you a sense, this is a story that, um, that I, I wrote, uh, that I saw these kids uh, sitting in the grass um, a few blocks away from one of the protests. And, um, 
It's called Couple, I'll just read you the text for it, which is here, but I'll just read it. It says, um, do you hear all that shouting? What? The shouting. Do you hear all that shouting? There's a big protest happening around the corner. Oh yeah, I guess I can hear it. I wasn't really listening. I was trying to hear your heartbeat. So just like a small little thing. Um, I'm gonna show you another one, uh, which is by um, a, a woman named Mary who lives in New York. This is a really simple story that she told about, about her dad. Uh, this is her dad in the swimming pool. This was the girl Mary when she was a little kid back in the 70s. And it's called Thank You Beautiful. If my father didn't know your name, he would call you beautiful. For those he didn't know quite well, they were flattered. But he knew my name, of course, and when he looked at me, like in this photo, and called me beautiful, well, the world stopped. I know now, he was the beautiful one. Um, so again, just like a really simple little thing. Um, and so I'm gonna show you another one. Uh, this is a story by a girl who lives in California. Um, this is actually a friend of mine from college. Her, uh, her sister committed suicide when we were in college, and um, she's had a lot of kind of insecurity issues ever since then. Uh, and uh, this is a, a picture of, um, the story's called Scrubs. I'll just read this to you. I met a boy in New Orleans who had scrubs from Baton Rouge. He lent them to me after he took off my silver sparkles dress. I was thankful because it was getting light out and I didn't want to wear my silver sparkles dress anymore. Before I left for San Francisco and after I had changed into my old jeans, he secretly slipped the scrubs into my suitcase. I didn't find them in, until a few days later when unpacking my things along with a note in his scrawled handwriting. Fun times with you. Some nights I wear them to bed and as I tie the string around my waist, I think of that beautiful, clear day we ran around New Orleans together and the way he looked over at me from the driver's seat. Life can be so good to you sometimes. Um, so, you know, it's, the idea here is to try to create a space on the internet that is devoted to a kind of deeper, longer lasting type of self-expression than you really find anywhere else on the web. Um, so in a sense, kind of the opposite of the, the worlds of Twitter and Facebook and all of this immediacy. Um, I think one thing we've seen is this kind of disposability of self-expression that's happened in the last 10 years where almost everything that we put out there into the world is immediately drowned by the torrent of stuff that comes after it and it's kind of forgotten to time immediately. Uh, and I, I'd like to really restore that feeling I had when I was taking, making those sketchbooks back in the old days of slowly crafting something and making it more beautiful over time. Um, so there's one other story I'd like to show you, uh, which is, actually has sound. Um, and this is one of the first ones told on Cowbird. Uh, can we get the sound? Thanks. So uh, I'm going to play you just the first three minutes Look of this. This is a story by a guy named Scott in New York, and this is about a French girl that he met through the internet, and uh, they ended up falling in love and dating for a few years, and then they had a bad breakup. And um, so I'll just, I'll play this for you. Look at her face. You could not paint anything like this. It is so silent. told me the story that this was her coming to her apartment and it had been raining and she was going through this process at the time uh, where she was photographing herself doing almost everything and she came in after the rain snapped this photograph of her face and when I saw this picture I fell in love I fell, I fell in love with, with her, I fell in love with this image, I fell in love with the whole concept of everything that she represented as a person, and I had never even met her in my life. We had become friends on Flickr, believe it or not, in 2005. I was heavily into Flickr, the concept of sharing photos and knowing someone 
through their photos was very new and exciting and I took to it and took it very seriously and did not really form any you know artistic relationships in the same way I was forming one with Angelique who I only knew by her tag name Weird Rubik's Cube which in and of itself is weird and uh seductive somehow but uh she had displayed her art and i had seen her life in normandy you know kept in touch i was even you know sending her photographs of the girl that i was dating saying isn't she wonderful not knowing at the time that it broke her heart to hear that from me uh what happened between Angelique and I is impossible to describe in a 10 megabyte mp3 but uh, looking at this photo in particular the hair ar around the ear and the hair across her eyes the shape of her lips her nose those eyes the eyebrows the expression vacant yet present the softness of her skin her neck the whole thing is just i mean it is really just super <laughs> i think this is just one of the most incredibly beautiful things I've i want to stop it there uh, it, it it ends much more sad it talks about how the relationship ultimately well she c comes to new york to meet him and then the relationship disintegrates but um you can watch that but um what like when I first saw this, this was one of the first stories authored in Cowbird, and when I first saw this, um, like I got this feeling in my stomach that was really excited because I had never felt this way on the internet before. I had never seen anything online before, and I've worked with the internet a lot, and I've never had something that made me feel this way that I've seen through a web browser before. And I thought that if we could just replicate that feeling and scale it, as they say in the internet world, that would introduce a beautiful force into our world. Um, so that's just a thought on that. And um, so the, the way this basically works is you tell a story uh, which has to have a photograph, and then you can also have sound, and you add text to it if you like, and then you can also add metadata. So this happened in France. Um, uh, these are the people in the story. These are other stories with these people. Um, you can click on any of this stuff and see other stuff in the ecosystem that, uh, that matches it. So these are other stories about love. Uh, eventually, you get a diary of your life, which shows you um, this kind of very non-reductionist self-portrait of, of of your stories. Um, so this is, uh, this is like my diary here, going back into time. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll just kind of leave it there. Um, this, is, uh, this is online, and I'd love you guys to go check it out, and you can request an invite. It's a small community right now that's, that's by invite only. Um, but uh, I'd, I'd love you to give it a try and see, see if, you, if you'd like to try telling some stories with this. Uh, so just check it out at covered.com and, and see what you like. So uh, thank you for listening. So. Uh, it's wired. It's funny that uh, uh, Kevin mentioned um, 1993, 1993, 92 actually was when you started. Um, 92 was also when um, Wired magazine started in the U.S. Uh, it was conceived of in 92. It, it actually debuted in January 1993. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, and the idea of of Wired at the beginning was um, the digital tsunami. It was uh, going to the uh, magazine was going to chart the Bengali typhoon that was the digital age that was about to sweep um, all of our lives. And uh, outside of the magazine, that, that experience didn't really exist yet. It wasn't extant yet. Uh, so the magazine tried to capture how it was going to happen and, and deliver it to people. Um, obviously, it's 20 years on, right? So a lot of that has happened. Um, and, and in many ways, um, the magazine was right. I, I've been there for the last 10 years, I should mention. So I wasn't, I wasn't part of that first um, wave, so to speak. But, but for the last 10 years, we've kept up this, this uh, ambition of helping people understand how their lives are going to change and what the powerful currents are that will change their lives. Uh, and to me, this, this notion of a feedback loop is one of those. Um, it's, a, it's in many ways a small idea, and many of the most powerful ideas um, I've come to learn are actually quite small ideas. They're, they're what might be considered incremental steps um, but there are incremental changes that have, have exponential effects. 
and it's recognizing where those incremental changes yield exponential benefits that I think is um, the hunt that we try to do at Wired. And I thought I'd give a little sample of, of something that I've been paying attention to of late. So I want to I want to go way back. We we Kevin let me um, let me go. He, he makes this seem like modern history since he went back uh, four or five hundred years. This is of course the steam engine, and um, all of you know who invented this steam engine, right? Who is it? Okay, some of you are not able to talk, evidently. Um, but uh, no, no, it was Thomas Newcomen. Um, Thomas Newcomen invented the steam engine. Um, you, there was a name that was mentioned. I'm going to get to that guy in a second. But um, Newcomen designed this engine to um, do a very simple thing. He, he had an idea that if you, if you take coal, boil water, and have the steam force a piston, you can, you can make a movement, right? You can move that, that piston. And he was using this. It was a huge thing, right? This was, this was um, 10, 15 meters tall. It was a massive machine. Um, and it took a huge amount of fuel. Uh, there was a huge amount of coal that they would have to burn. And that was good because it was only usable at coal mines. What they used it for is to, um, they built it right on top of a coal mine and they used it to pump water out of the coal mine. When you dug, uh, dug the mine in coal, you would have groundwater seep into the bottom. And so you needed a way to get the water out. So that was Newcomen's great invention, right? It was the steam, steam um, engine. And it was, it was great for what it was designed to do. It, it was um, really good at pumping coal out or pumping water out of coal mines, but it wasn't really able to be used beyond that because it was so big, so um, fuel intensive. Uh, so there were about 80, 90 of these um, made around England. And that was, that was wonderful until, of course, um, somebody else came along. Uh, and that was James Watt. That was the fellow that um, we now associate with the steam engine because he made um, all sorts of s significant improvements, tweaks, um, to Newcomen's engine. And what he did, um, he, he, the, his big one was a separate chamber for steam, and that kind of was his, his great um, brainstorm. But what actually made the steam engine something that was able to be used outside of water pumps, used, used for more than just pumping, was this. This was um, his flywheel um, uh, regulator. Those two balls were, were these heavy weights, and as the steam built up in the machine, they would whip around and go up the shaft, um, and as they got to the top, they would release the valve, and some steam would get released. And then the thing would spin back down the other way, and then up and down it would go. So it was a regulator that made the machine work, well, regularly. And by doing that, it was a dependable and steady source of energy. And by doing that, by adding feedback to the steam engine, that was where we got the industrial um, mechanism. That's where this became not just something for pumping water, but actually something that, that could be used to give um, power sources and energy sources throughout a whole new industrial area, era. So, so feedback was the incremental change on top of the steam engine that actually was, as I say, exponentially important. Um, and the reason I like to go to the steam engine and, and this, this regulator is because um, it's a great way of thinking about uh, feedback, and it's, it's a very precise, almost quantitative, and in fact, largely quantitative way of using um, information. We talk about, I guess this is the, my, my, my um, way of getting into the memory session, is, is feedback is a way of taking information, what would what, what otherwise, otherwise be called a memory, um, building on that information and deciding to change, making a change in response to a, a shift in the system. So that's what, that's what the regulators were. And that's what um, a few, a few uh, years later, this fellow, Norbert Wiener, decided to uh, do and actually codify a little bit more thoroughly. Um, Wiener was um, a mathematician at MIT in the 1930s and 40s. And he um, was also enamored with this idea of feedback in engineering and mechanical systems. What he did is he, he codified it into a discipline all its own called cybernetics. Um, this is cybernetics is, is the discipline that, of course, gives us the root cyber. Um, he got it from uh, the Greek, um, meaning self-governance. Um, but cybernetics is where we get, um, where William Gibson got cyberspace, um, the cyber part of cyberspace. Um, what, what Wiener was involved with in the 40s was trying to turn uh, bombs and uh, rockets into missiles. So if you have a, it's actually very akin to the steam engine, you light a fuse, you light a fuel source, and uh, with, a, with a rocket, you light it and off it goes and you hope you aimed it in the right direction. Um, but if, if you add feedback to that system, you all of a sudden have turned a rocket into a missile, right? Then it's actually 
acting on, 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 um, based on where it's going and changing its orientation. Um, that was one of the great uh, advents of um, uh, kind of the military age. The dawn of the Cold War was because of, because of the uh, ability to turn rockets into guided missiles. Uh, by that time, Wiener had, had given up on, on war machines, and he was interested in bringing feedback and cybernetics um, to human systems. He was very engaged in how uh, you can take this principle out of engineering and uh, the mechanical world and bring it to human systems, organizations, and even uh, actually human individual behavior. And that was a great idea and it had great promise, but it was very difficult to do. It was, it was almost impossible to do because it's very difficult to quantify human behavior. Uh, it's very difficult to capture it in a way um, that you can actually respond directly to it. Um, we can, we can um, kind of capture it in memories and, and kind of um, a psychological mode, uh, which is actually the way cybernetics got reduced oftentimes was towards this kind of pop psychology. Um, but the notion, the, the intrinsic notion that Wiener had that, that we could use feedback to really um, quantitatively improve our, our status as humans and our organizations and our individuals was something that had great appeal. Um, now, uh, if I could just pop back to the idea of missiles, this was the tool that made a guided missile work, right? This was an accelerometer. Uh, accelerometers basically just measure movement. Um, and uh, this was a couple centuries after uh, Wiener was dealing with them, but, but at the time, this is from a, a Titan II intercontinental ballistic missile. It cost $100,000, and that's fine if you're the US Pentagon, you can afford that, and uh, you can make all the accelerometers you need. Um, but now, accelerometers have changed. Um, now, accelerometers look like this, and they cost less than a dollar. Um, and this brings us to the uh, what I call the, the, the new era of feedback, the golden age of feedback, or the halcyon days of feedback are right now. Um, this, we are at a moment when this idea of feedback can be integrated into all of our lives. We can actually um, see Norbert Wiener's vision come true because things have gotten so cheap and small and tiny. Um, the Fitbit was mentioned earlier. That's um, a tool that has, uh, that's based on this. It cost $100, but um, the actual tool involved is less than a dollar. Um, when you get to something like this, when you're able to kind of take a little piece like this, um, you can do all sorts of things to get data and information. The sensor, um, I mean, there, there's a whole uh, armada of sensors. It's not just our uh, accelerometers. Um, but when you get to a sensor-based world where there are little tools picking up data that can measure things so cheaply and so readily and so automatically, well, we get to a transformative moment. And that's where we are right now. Now, I want to give a couple examples of, of this. And this is um, Sparked. It's a, it's a Dutch company um, that had the idea of, of taking little sensors and sticking them in, in cow um, herds, right? So, so for farmers in Luxembourg, um, Spark decided that they were going to um, take this cow herd and, and uh, put accelerometers and other sensors in the cows so that the farmers could better understand where the cows were. And so based on where the cows were, they would have the food. And if certain cows weren't moving around as much, they would, um, they would uh, know they were sick or whatnot. Um, it was a great idea. It, it ran afoul of uh, EU um, regulation. The, uh, the regulators, the EU, was worried that um, it would invade cows' privacy rights. Um, I'm serious. Uh, or the farmers' privacy rights or whatnot. So Spark just had a hard time getting off the ground. But that's the kind of thing that you can imagine people would do with sensors, right? Is you, you stick them in cows. Or um, you could do this. This is a uh, German company called Fraunhofer um, uh, that just, this just uh, came out uh, earlier this month. These are these sleeves. They look like cycling sleeves, um, but they're actually accelerometers uh, embedded into those sleeves. And if you're an industrial worker and charged with putting pieces together, um, Fraunhofer has the idea that um, this will be able to measure how effectively and efficiently people are working um, how quickly they'll be able to put together the machine. Now that sounds horrible, right? That should sound horrible. Um, that's the kind of big brother monitoring that we, we all are kind of wary about with technology. Um, uh, it's, it's, um, they, the Fraunhofer's defense is that it's better than the alternative, which is to have um, a spot worker looking over these workers with um, a, a stop clock. So it may be better than that, but it's certainly not what we envision. 
And in many ways, this kind of use, and even the sparked um, implants in cows, that is akin, I would say, to the, the Newcomen kind of steam engine, right? That, this use of sensors does not produce exponential change. This is a kind of um, use of sensors that, that sp serves specific purposes, but is not yet a transformative um, solution. To get transformative, we need to give this power to us, to individuals. And that's where we get to um, the fact that all of you are carrying sensors. Um, I, I am guessing that all of you have a smartphone, and all of you, therefore, are carrying at least this number of sensors. Um, these are all sensors that are in any uh, Android or, or iPhone. Um, and this is a profusion of sensors that we are only now starting to take advantage of. So, so it's a kind of nifty um, race between developers to see what among this shopping list of sensors they can put together and create new apps that will create feedback loops, will capture data, um, the data of movement or location or what have you that people are doing, and deliver that data back to people so that they can serve, um, that they can meet different goals. So um, these are where we start getting into human behavior, those issues of human behavior that are so challenging. Um, when you think about uh, healthcare, which is a special interest of mine, or, or climate change, um, so much of this is rooted, so much of these problems, these challenges that we face are rooted in human behavior. Uh, 50 to 60 to 70 percent of our healthcare costs in the United States are uh, broken down to behavioral issues, um, smoking, obesity, um, drug compliance. If we can start using these tools, these, these opportunities to give people feedback about the choices they make and the decisions they're making and the movements they're doing, what they're eating and whatnot, we're going to be able to chip away at some of those behavioral issues. So this is the laundry list, um, the basis on which the food back, feedback loop is going to become integrated into all of our lives. Um, this is just one example is the WakeMate. Um, this is a, an accelerometer that is a little cuff that you wear. Um, there are a lot of different uh, tools. So I, the, the examples that I use are just kind of um, somewhat random. But the reason I, I like to mention the sleep stuff, um, there's, there's another tool called Zio, and there are other there are little apps that you can buy for your iPhone that um, promise to uh, basically monitor your sleep. But, but just think about it. Sleep um, is literally a dark opaque part of our lives, right? It's, it's a great unknown. And all of a sudden, we have a sensor that we're wearing, and, and that becomes turned into data. To me, that's the metaphor for what the feedback loop is doing. It's capturing information uh, where there was otherwise darkness. It's giving us clarity and, and some sort of guidance where we had none before. Um, another great example is this uh, company out of Los Angeles called Belkin. They're emphasizing feedback loops for electric and other um, energy consumption. Uh, what they're doing here is that this is a, a very rudimentary tool. Tool they have much more sophisticated devices in the works, but um, this this goes to sh this is a simple example of how this stuff works. You you plug this into a socket and then you plug your device into a socket, and all of a sudden you're being delivered information with not much not only how much that individual appliance is consuming, but it translates it into dollars and cents. It translates it into meaningful data um, that might actually compel us to choose to turn something off or to unplug it, to change our behavior, because all of a sudden we see what we couldn't see before. Um, uh, and then there's Green Goose, which is um, a great example of where this might be going. Green Goose is a startup that just started to ship uh, this month on January 1st. And uh, what they've done, these are little stickers that are about the um, size of, of uh, a sugar cube or two sugar cubes. And they have, each of these has an accelerometer uh, tucked inside. And as you can see, they're coded to um, different uses. So there's one for a violin. And the, uh, the engineers at Green Goose have coded algorithms. So based on the movement that um, you would be putting the uh, sticker on, so on a violin, you put it onto the bow. And based on the, uh, it doesn't even matter how good a violinist you are, right? It just matters that you're moving the, the bow. And it recognizes that, and it, it starts to quantify your movements. It gives you points that you can use in a game system that they've built um, on their, their uh, uh, the website. But what this does is it's moving so that the, the, um, the individual is creating the ecosystem, right? The individual is creating the whole uh, arena in which there are sensors. 
It's not some uh, uh, company that is putting the sensors out there and, and using them to monitor us or asking us to use their tools. It's, it's us deciding that we can use these um, tools and these sensors to understand ourselves better, understand everything in our lives better. And this is where the Internet of Things um, actually happens. Internet of Things is this, this phrase that's been kicking around for, for 10, 15 years now, uh, which speaks of this, this great day in the future when the Internet will not just be um, based in computers, but will actually, everything will be a node in the network. And that network will happen because we choose to create it. Um, it will be us who decide to make it happen. Now the change you get, um, just for the behavioralists in the room, um, the change that you get when you introduce feedback loops into people's lives uh, is about 10%. So if you uh, have a weight loss program and you add feedback loops, an intense kind of feedback loop program to it, you get people to lose about 10% of their weight. Um, that isn't, doesn't seem like much, perhaps. Um, if, you're, if you're 300 pounds and you lose 30 pounds, that's still not necessarily a visible reduction. Um, but it turns out that 10%, as, as incremental as that sound, it actually has very powerful effects in a lot of these situations. So when you do get people to lose 10% of their body weight, they reduce their risk of heart attack by 50%. So you get this kind of transformative effect on the back end um, based on a, a rather small um, change in the front end. Uh, for speeding, for instance, if you get people to reduce their highway speeds by about 10%, you're reducing highway fatalities, at least in the United States, by about 30 to 40%. So you're getting a much larger delta downstream based on that, that significant 10% stream. And, and this 10% figure turns up again and again and again. When you bring feedback into beha human behavior, you get people to improve their behavior by about 10%. And that matters. That matters quite a bit. So. Um, so that's, that's what I wanted to leave you with, is, is this idea of, of technological change is not really um, this kind of big, uh, unexpected, um, almost unfathomable new technology that will change our lives in a way we couldn't figure out before, we couldn't even imagine before. It doesn't really work like that. Sometimes it does, but far more often what happens is that it's it's a mechanism that is, is actually quite familiar, right? That dates back 200, 300 years old. Um, that, that it's something like a feedback mechanism that was, was quite obvious um, uh, to James Watt. When he finally got it, it made perfect sense. Um, and it's that same idea. It's taking that same idea and just reproducing it and reinserting it into contemporary life. And feedback is, in fact, goes much deeper than just historical origins. It, it has biological origins, or, origins as well. Um, homeostasis, the idea that our cells, our very corpuscles, are trying to maintain a balance, that's, that's a feedback loop. Evolution is a feedback loop. This idea that, that as organisms, we're constantly evolving and learning based on what works and what doesn't work. The opportunity to take this principle and use it for our own lives, to consciously put it into action, is now upon us. And for me, that's a very big deal. So thank you very much. Dankeschön. What I plan to talk about today is basically the greatest sensor we have ever built, and it was built by the computer scientists. But um, let me start um, somewhere else. Let me start the talk with a question. So what I'll do now, I'll show you a set of things, and I will ask you to think what do, what do all these things have in common. So I have, I think, around 10 of them. So bear with me. Think what do these, thing, what do these things have in common. So um, let's start. Right, the first one is world economy, uh, human cell. Roads, uh, brain, internet, friends and family, media and information, um, and the society. So um, there is tons of other examples, but what do these things have in common? Right? And the, the thing that they really have in common is that behind each of these complex systems, there is a network that defines the interactions between the components. Right? So really, Basically, everything around us is a network uh, of interconnected parts. And we've been living in these networks for all our lives. Right? So really, if we want to understand uh, the complex systems around us, we need to map out and understand uh, the networks behind them. And this is basically exactly um, the research that my group is doing. Right? So really, what we are trying to understand is why are the networks the organized the way they are? 
Right, so um, I'm, I'm a professor at Stanford Computer Science Department where um, now after two years I have a group of like 12 PhD students and postdocs where basically we are combining two things. We are combining co analysis of complex networks uh, with big data analytics to basically build computational models of humanity. And we work with a number of companies that are kind enough to provide us data. And let me show you sort of what's the, what's the output or what do I mean by models of humanity. So for example, this, this thing up here, this is a result of our collaboration with, friend, uh, with Facebook, where we were working um, with them on their friend recommendation engine. So basically the people you may know feature, right? And um, this little thingy up there, this can predict eight out of your 20 new friends on Facebook. So basically around 40% of Facebook friendships can be predicted um, ahead of time by just doing careful data analysis and letting the data tell you what the good model is. Right? So really, um, why should you do net networks or why now? Right? So sort of over human history or even before, sort of since the life started, right? There, there's, there have been networks around us, right? The, the oldest network we have is the metabolic network, right? So this is around 4 billion years old network of around 103 nodes, right? Um, social network is another very old network and also very large one, but the problem with that one was that it was nearly impossible for, for us to map it out. Right? But really when the age of networks became was uh, in the last, let's say, 10, 15, 20 years. Right? Sort of, we have today technological networks um, like power grids. Right? This is um, a hundred year old network. Right? But the internet and World Wide Web, both having um, billions, tens of billions, hundreds of billions of, of nodes, um, these are things that are 20, 50 years old. And right, of course, uh, Facebook, the 800 million um, node network is only seven years old, right? So really, today, we have access to huge network data that are describing a significant part of um, humanity. So what happened right, to the web is that World Wide Web in the last decade basically transformed into this vast information resource where people interact with one another and the content that they both produce and consume. Right? So basically today, the web is the sensor into humanity today. Right? Basically everything we do uh, leaves some kind of digital trace on the web. Right? So basically web captures the pulse of humanity, what we are thinking, uh, what we are doing, and what we know. So really, as daily activities of hundreds of millions of people are migrating to the web, uh, this creates massive digital traces of human activity that can very naturally be modeled and represented as these complex dynamic networks of interactions between humans, information, and so on. Right? So social networks, social graphs um, are an example of uh, these kinds of things. And um, to, uh, to give you a flavor of what kinds of analysis we do, I just picked a topic for today, right? So, so since this is DLD, I'll be talking about um, media and information. How can you do large-scale data analysis to better understand how um, information is be being created, consumed, um, and so on, right? So really what sort of the, the question to have in mind for the rest of the talk is to, to think about um, the question about how the information flows, let's say, uh, between different uh, types of media, between our us and our personal social networks, and so on. And um, more specifically, there are sort of three questions that I will ask and I'll give you sort of answers. So I'll give you answers, I won't, to tell, I won't tell you how to get these answers, right? So uh, the first question that, that I'll ask is, for example, this thing, right? Do blogs lead or trail mainstream media in reporting stories or news, right? Um, then I'd like to know which are the key media for spreading, let's say, of technological stories. And then maybe based on this idea of diffusion of information through networks, I could say, you know, which news sites, which, let's say, blogs should I follow to be most up to date, right? So that I hear about important information as quickly as possible, right? So uh, let me start, right? So if you would want to do this, um, this was pretty much impossible until only a few years ago. And the reason for that is that if you'd want to do this kind of large scale media analysis, you need to have nearly complete picture of what's going on um, in the media. Today, right, we can basically get that. So, so together with our collaborators from Spinner, we are, we are collecting 40 million news media articles and blog posts every day, right? So basically, we are getting nearly complete um, media coverage in the United States. So we get basically everything that Google News has, plus data from around four or five million different blogs. Right? And this, is, this allows us to do this now uh, large-scale analysis of hundreds of millions of news articles and try to understand uh, what's going on in the media. 
Um, and um, the, the methodology that we, that we developed, we call it meme tracker, and basically allows us to identify these short textual phrases or memes, um, for example, like war on terror or lipstick on a pig, uh, that they diffuse through these uh, articles, right? And this allows us to generate these very succinct maps of media coverage or attention devoted to uh, different pieces of news or um, short textual phrases. So what I have here is, um, now a bit old example from 2008 US presidential election campaign, um, which is completely um, automatically generated, so no human, human, human in the loop uh, whatsoever. And what this shows you is uh, the sort of the most important phrases that were use, used by, by the media to cover the, the election campaign. And sort of there are two high level observations you can see here. So the first one is that there are these periods when media sense to sort of some kind, some kind of uh, synchronize and uh, devote their attention to a particular, uh, particular story, maybe the, the story about the lipstick on a pig, right? And the other thing is that these stories seem, seem to be very short-lived, right? A day or two and everything is over. So really, what this allows us to do, because we are able now to trace these uh, little pieces of information, it allows us to go back to the original question that I asked, right? So do blogs lead or trail mainstream media on the average, right? So basically what you can do is now you can take every media site and either label it as a blog or as a mainstream media site, and you can now measure at what point in time does, do these types of media tend to mention these little phrases that I showed before, right? And if you do this average case analysis, then it turns out that blogs tend to trail mainstream media for 2.5 hours, right? And even sort of this makes a few people here maybe a bit unhappy, but this, the answer is much more complex, right? Actually, it turns out that there are two populations of bloggers. Basically, you have the professional bloggers who lead the mainstream media, then you have the mainstream media, and then sort of the handoff of information back to the, uh, back to the blogosphere that is sort of feeding off um, uh, from that, right? But one way or another, this is one kind of measurement that you can now do or a computational experiment. The other thing that you see here, for example, is that mainstream media, so the, the red curve, right? They are much quicker at forgetting or stopping talking about things while blogosphere seems to be like an echo chamber. So things go on on the blogosphere uh, much longer. Um, another thing that, that this kind of large scale data allows us to do is it allows us to infer networks um, of information diffusion, right? So often, oftentimes these networks are implicit or invisible. So really the, uh, the idea is that we can take, for example, uh, the media sites. Here I'm showing you the network of 5,000 media sites where I have uh, connections basically based on, based on the fact that you can think of it that one website is uh, repeating the same stories as the other website that it is linked to but with certain temporal lag. Right? And this looks nice and everything, but actually if you zoom in, it becomes quite interesting, right? So the same network, just zoom in. So instead of 5,000, now I'm showing you, what, 30, 50 nodes. And um, here I'm showing, also showing you URLs. I hope, yeah, I hope you can see this, right? So what you see here, for example, is that you have this nice uh, topical clusters, right? So my, my red cluster, my red circle, is basically um, a political part of the blogosphere. Um, and then um, the, the, um, the green cluster is um, uh, basically our media devoted to entertainment and at the bottom blue thing are the technological um, sites, right? But what's interesting is sort of what is the role of every site in this network? And for example, here, the big red circle that corresponds to the Huffington Post, which is sort of deeply embedded in this political side of things. But then, for example, um, you have Salon.com um, down there also in the political cluster that is more towards also towards entertainment and technology. And this is also who sort of makes sense, right? People who know Salon.com, they know that it focuses on politics and also articles about music, books, uh, and uh, films, right? So from this, we can get some insights into how does the media ecosystem work at large. What we can also do now, since we, we, we were able to infer this network, we can start thinking about information flows, right? So really, the way the, way the, the metaphor to think about this is the following, right? So you, 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 let's assume that there is some little obscure technological story that then gets picked up by some blog and then, you know, uh, a few other bigger bloggers and maybe technological websites all the way down to uh, mainstream media sites and then to the rest of the population. Right, and having this large scale um, data allows us actually to trace this process and allows us to study it, right? So in some sense, this has been going, this kind of process has been going on for uh, tens or hundreds of years, right? But only now we can actually have a way to trace it or to, uh, to measure and observe it, right? And actually, um, for this particular example, again, if you go back and do the measurement, it turns that around three to 5% of all the um, popular stories actually started on the blogosphere, right? And the rest is more uh, daily news and things like that. 
Um, but going back to my original question, right? So what are the key media for adoption of technological uh, news? What you can do is basically you can, you can now again create this kind of model that tries to predict what will be the popularity of a particular news phrase based on what media mentioned it in the past. And what I'm trying to show you here is the comparison uh, between news agencies and blogs for the popularity of um, uh, stories on uh, technology. And the, uh, what you see here is basically that, uh, for example, news agencies have high influence on adoption of technological stories, but their influence decays very quickly, right? Sort of a, a few hours after Associated Press publishes the story, nobody talks about that story anymore. While if you look at the blogosphere, the, the influence or the buzz there uh, is much more long-lasting. Um, and this now leads us to the, to the last piece of, uh, to the last question, right? So what if I want to use and exploit this idea of information flows to maybe do better recommendations of what news sites um, should, we, should we follow? And the way you can formalize this, basically you can formalize this as a graph covering problem, basically like a set cover. And the idea is the following. The, the question is that you, you have a budget, budget of nodes that you want to select, and you want to select these nodes, these media sites, in such a way that you basically topically cover uh, the whole graph, right? So the idea is if I, if I select a node, then this node is sort of covering the topics uh, of its neighboring nodes, right? And I want to select the minimum number of such nodes so that I cover the blogosphere. And this allows me to, to basically find um, small sets of blogs or media sites to follow uh, to be most up to date. And what is maybe interesting that this same problem that I showed here can solve, or the same formulation can solve a very different problem. So here's a very different problem that uh, uh, US, US Environmental Protection Agency wants to get solved, right? So now away from media and here we are actually looking at real networks. So this is now um, a real water city distribution network where every node, in, think of it as a house and edges between the houses, the connections are actually physical pipes through which the water flows. And, and what can happen to these water distribution networks is that, that there can be some contaminations um, for one reason or the other that sort of spread through these networks, right? And the task here is that you want to place sensors onto this network so that whenever, wherever this uh, contamination happens, you will, uh, it will hit your sensor as quickly as possible. You will raise, a, raise an alarm and you will um, save lives, right? But at the, at, the, at, the, at the back, it's actually the same problem as I was telling you about before, right? So instead of detecting information epidemics and saying, who should I follow to be infected with big, big information epidemics as quickly as possible, here I'm asking where, which, in which water uh, net, network junctions should I put my sensor? sensors so that I can dis detect disease outbreaks, right? At the end, it's the same problem or the same machinery can solve it. So really, this is um, what I wanted to show. And here is a quick conclusion or reflection, right? So really, if, if we want to understand humanity, we first want to understand the networks that surround us, right? And really what happened in the last few years is that um, we have access to this large scale uh, data on these networks, basically, um, that, that, that we never had before, right? And this allows us to now do this aggregate large scale analysis of um, phenomena that have been taking place uh, for a very long time, but we didn't have a way uh, to actually capture or model that. Uh, the other important thing is that by, by having big data, basically, we can start observing patterns or model things that are invisible at smaller scales, right? Sort of things that maybe get lost in the noise if, I, if my um, sample size is too small. And really, the whole idea is that there is um, lots of interesting problems. I just showed you sort of one small part of my, about, my, about what my research group is doing. But uh, the whole idea is that what we need is really good computer science algorithms. So I'll end with that. Thanks.